Good morning, everybody. Um, I know y'all can't talk back. I'm sorry. Um, today, we're glad y'all could join us today for the Cow to Cup workshop, the Cow Side of Milk Quality. This is our first in the series of three workshops that we'll be doing talking about the pathway of milk from the cow that creates it to the cup that you drink it out of. We are doing something in this webinar that's a little bit different to try to make it a little bit more interactive and to get everybody involved. We are using something called Poll Everywhere. And this program allows you to text in answers in response to poll questions so we can kind of see what everybody's thinking as we go. Um, so there's going to be instructions on every slide to tell you how to get onto that when we're doing them. We're only going to do four or five throughout the presentation. So don't worry, you don't have to text me that many times. Um, um, are there any preemptive questions of what you're hoping we're going to learn about today? Feel free to throw them in the Q&A. We got an excellent question um, that we'll, we'll hopefully answer throughout, but we'll, we'll revisit it in a second. The question was, why does the cow side matter since the milk will be pasteurized anyway? And that is the crux of what we'll be talking about today. And it was a very good question. And hopefully by the end, we've answered that. And it's a nice, long, complicated answer. So I'm going to let the presentation do the work on that one instead of giving you the entire presentation the next few minutes. All right, I think we've got about half of the people that said that they were going to attend. So we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am going to turn off my video so it doesn't draw any extra bandwidth from all of y'all watching. All right, so hopefully you can all still hear me. And with the cow side of milk quality, first thing I want to get started with today is asking you a question. So my question is, what brought you here today? Why did you, why were you interested in this topic? So you're going to text Liz2020 to the number 37607 just one time, and that will join you for the entire meeting. And then just text A, B, C, D, or E for what brought you here today. So I'll give everybody a minute to get started and start doing that. Thanks, a few more coming in. So a bunch of y'all just joined for fun. I am perfectly okay with that. <laughs> all right, we're gonna go ahead and lock this one. I'll move on to our next slide. Thank y'all for responding and for playing my game. All right, the next one, this should actually generate a word cloud of what we're hoping to gain from today's talk. So what are you hoping to get out of today? One word answers, please. You can send multiple things if you would like. Knowledge, perfect. I'm loving these words, guys. Keep them coming. Loving this word cloud. All right, it looks like it's kind of settled down a little bit. So it looks like most of us are learning to, are hoping to get some knowledge, maybe some facts, some information about how the cow side of milk quality care works um, and some insight into what we're doing or, or maybe what we could be doing on our operation if we're looking for guidance. Um, Nothing that we're going to talk about today is going to be groundbreaking and we're we'll go through the other side. Yes, I do love this graphic. Hopefully y'all are all chuckling a little bit while looking at your screens right now. But we're talking about the other side because this is really where the journey to quality milk starts. Once it comes out of the udder, that's kind of the quality that we start with. So anything that we do on the processing side, we have to start from that base that we get off of the farm. So today we're going to talk about the basics of cow care. So what happens on a dairy farm? What are some of the main things that we're always going to provide to these animals? And then we're going to talk about understanding the udder because this is really where milk quality is determined. So we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy. We're not going to get too terribly deep into the woods on this. Don't freak out anybody. And then we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about mastitis. And we're going to talk about mastitis because that's one of our main threats to quality milk and that starts at the cow level. 
And then we're going to talk about what farmers do to protect the milk supply. And most of that comes down to cow care, which is why we're talking about the cow side of milk quality. So why dairy? And I get asked this question about why do dairy farms matter? What drew you to dairy? And why should I be interested in being either part of the dairy industry or supporting the dairy industry? And the first thing that I always say is because it is a group of very hardworking animals backed by a group of very hardworking people. This is one of the only industries that does not shut down ever. At midnight on Christmas Eve, something might go wrong and the cow and the farmer are both working. It's also one of the top earners in the state of Tennessee. It contributes about $150 million each year to our Tennessee economy, which is a pretty sizable chunk. Um, and again, 24-7, 365. The cows don't stop and neither do the people. And the amount of dedication that it takes to be a dairy farmer um, is, is really amazing to me. And that's definitely something that's attracted me to this industry and trying to support it as best I can. If we think about the dairy world, it's a lot more than just a farmer and a cow. And I don't think we always think about this when we're on the outside looking in, or even when we're managing our own herd, but there are a lot of things that go into running a successful dairy farm. You have to manage nutrition of your animals, so you're a nutritionist. You have to manage herd health, so you're kind of like a veterinary assistant. You have to deal with waste management to try to decrease your overall footprint to make sure that your waste is going into the proper collection vessel and making sure that it's spread appropriately on your land. You have to manage your facilities, so you're a bit of an engineer at the same time. You have to manage your milk quality, which is one of the main things we're talking about today, but milk is the main product that comes from a dairy farm. So if we're not producing a quality product, one, we're not being paid as well, we're not as an efficient of a business, but we don't really have a business to move forward with if we don't have quality milk coming out of our cattle. Milk is one of the most highly regulated foods in the United States. And we're gonna talk about the cow side today. We'll get more into the processing side of it next month. And then a comparison of raw milk to pasteurized milk in our last webinar in November. Genetics is another big thing that's been playing a role in the dairy world for quite some time. Um, if you're more familiar with beef cattle, there's a bunch of different breeds, there's a bunch of different crosses. In dairy, we really just have the main seven. We have Holsteins, we have Guernseys, we've got Brown Swiss, we've got Milking Shorthorns, we've got Jerseys, we've got Ayrshires, and we've got Red and White, so no particular order, whichever breed happens to be your favorite. But we've worked really hard with these seven breeds to make sure that we have animals that are healthy, that produce a quality product, and that can produce quality calves to continue the generation going. So we have to be a bit of a geneticist as well. Reproduction is what makes milk quality possible. We'll do some myth busting in a minute, but without reproduction, we don't have milk. We don't have lactation. But these dairies are still small businesses. So the economics of that business and that business management perspective is very important as well. If a dairy can't cash flow, like any other small business that you may support, they're not going to be able to survive. Human resources is another one that we have to think about with dairy, and that's going to be labor management working across multiple generations um, or working with your parents or working with your kids. That's some human resource things that we have to navigate that can be a little bit tricky. So some quick dairy facts and figures. You won't spend too much time here, but I wanted to let y'all know that more than 37,400 U.S. dairy farms provide the milk, cheese, yogurt, and other dairy products to the U.S. and other countries. We also export some of that product. Um, but obviously from the farm comes the milk and then the processing side is what turns that into fluid milk. So bottled milk that you're going to have in your fridge, cheeses, yogurts, and other dairy products. About 97% of dairy farms are family owned and operated. And I see that statistic surprising some people that it's that high. I also find it surprising to some people that the average herd size on a dairy farm is 187 cows. In Tennessee, our state herd average is 169. So most people find that a lot smaller than what they're thinking the national average is gonna be. The vast majority of our dairy farms have less than 200 cows, which makes that average make sense. But the farms that have more than 100 cows produce 86% of the milk, just because of the sheer volume that they're able to get. And a lot of that comes from specialization and being really good at what you did when you were smaller and having the ability to grow. So it's still a family business. It's just a family business that got a little bit bigger. Um, California is responsible for 21% of the milk supply. 
and dairy is the number one ag business in California, Idaho, Arizona, Utah, New Hampshire, Michigan, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Wisconsin. It's not a number one in Tennessee, but it's pretty high up there. So we just talked about some of the main states, California being the top. Tennessee is the 30th as far as producing dairy in the United States. And our top milk producing counties are Loudoun, Monroe, Bradley, Bedford, McMinnon, Washington. So you can see we kind of have a knot down here in the south central, southeastern part of the state. And a couple outliers in the northeastern part and in the south central. But we've got dairy cattle in quite a few counties across our state. And I see some producers from multiple areas across the state that are on with us today. So thanks for joining guys. If you think about what the focus of a dairy farmer is, it really is clean, comfortable cows, plenty of food and water, good reproductive management, environmental stewardship, and keeping that family business going. Because without all of these things working together in harmony, that small business isn't going to make economic sense, and it's not going to be as able to weather poor economic times. So farmers are really focused on making sure that their cows are as happy and as healthy as possible and making sure that they're not limited in any way. So some myth busting, and I tried to turn this into a quiz, but it didn't work very well for this thing. But in case you're wondering, only a female cow can produce milk. No bull. That's something that I get asked more than I thought I would. And something that reproduction is super important is a cow must have had a calf in order to produce milk. Without having that calf, that cow is not gonna lactate and she is not going to produce milk which is why we try to have a calf at least once a year to keep that cow productive and to keep that milk flowing. And just in case you're wondering, brown cows do not produce chocolate milk. You're gonna need some Nestle chocolate and some milk to make that on your home on your own. As far as what cows do all day, they have a pretty cushy life, I must say. Most of their day is spent resting, whether that is lying down in a stall or sleeping somewhere, 10 to 14 hours of a day, so 50% 50, 50 of their day, they're spending resting. Three to five hours they're focused on eating and two and a half to three and a half hours a day they're focused on milking. About 30 minutes on drinking and two to three hours standing and walking. So when we think about trying to maximize cow care and do quality control to make sure we have a quality product, some of the places that we focus are the resting area obviously since this is 50% of their day and then when they're milking and we'll get more into that as we go. The udder is the gateway to milk quality, and we're gonna use some terms today that some of you may not be familiar with, and the first one is mastitis. So some people might think mastitis is infection. Mastitis is not. Mastitis is inflammation of the udder, usually in response to some kind of bacteria or some other kind of pathogen or a trauma, but it is inflammation. It is not infection. Somatic cell count or somatic cells is our word for white blood cells in the udder. Now, my husband asked me yesterday, why don't you call them white blood cells? And I said, I don't know, sweetie, that's above my pay grade. But for the cow, we're gonna talk about somatic cells, but that's all that term means is the white blood cells that are in the udder. Milk quality, we think about things that are monitored by somatic cell count. So that has a big role in the quality of the milk that we have, the bacteria count that's present in the milk and the absence of impurities. So mostly things like blood or when a cow gets mastitis and it does proceed to an infection, we can sometimes get changes in the milk. So flakes in the milk, clots in the milk, but that milk does not go for sale. And we'll talk more about that later. The udder, which is also referred to as the mammary gland, is really the money maker of a dairy cow. And that's because that's where milk is created. That is where components from blood are turned into milk. And, and no, there's not a little scientist in there saying, ooh, blood become milk, but that's where the cells take those precursors from the blood and turn it into milk that comes out of the teat and feeds a calf or feeds me or you. And it's also the protector of the milk supply because of the way that udder is structured. And we'll get into that in a second. So on a cow, we're looking at her udder right here. And this is just showing you that lots of different animals have an udder or have a mammary gland. In the cow, we have something that looks like this. And this would be one individual quarter. There are four quarters in an udder. And there is one canal and one cistern per teat. So we have a teat cistern right here and one, two, three, four teats. So one canal, one cistern per teat. And all of these little lobules up here are something that we would call alveoli. And we're gonna get into that in a minute. So some structures I want y'all to be aware of so we can think about how the cow itself protects milk quality are labeled here. So this is a cross section of an udder. One is the lateral suspensory ligament. So that's what holds the udder up and into the body. 
The median suspensory ligament is what you can actually see if you're looking at the back end of a cow, and it's that really strong, sharp line that cuts the udder in half. And that median suspensory ligament really holds the udder up tight and against the body. So if we have a strong median suspensory ligament and a strong lateral suspensory ligament, that keeps the udder from sagging with age and dragging in the dirt or getting stepped on by somebody else. Or in a beef cow, it keeps it from getting too low so that a calf can't nurse. The teat ends are really the only pathway into and out of the udder, and that's what we're seeing right here. You can kind of see with this little line, that's actually the opening into the teat end where milk would pass through. If we're looking into that cross section a little bit more, I know this is a little bit blurry and I apologize, you can see the teat sphincter, which is this one right here, and that's actually what holds the teat closed. So that teat sphincter has to open in order for milk to come out and it has to stay closed the rest of the time to keep things like bacteria or dirt or random anything, honestly, flies from getting into the udder. Now, not the flies themselves, but landing on that teat and then potentially um, pot contaminating it with bacteria or some other type of pathogen. The teat cistern and the gland cistern are where a milk pool inside of an udder or a quarter. And you can see all these teeny tiny little things up here and you see this little call out this is showing you what the rest of that mammary tissue looks like. So it is a dense tissue that's made up of all of these little alveoli that have ductules that go into this teat cistern, this gland cistern and eventually empty into the teat cistern. So the udder is not just this big bag of milk. It is this big mass of tissue that creates milk. So that's why when we go into milk a cow, we're really key on stimulation because oxytocin is what happens after we stimulate that cow. So we start stripping those teats or a calf would butt the bag or something like that. That squeezes these myoepithelial cells on these tiny, tiny alveoli. This is about the size of the head of a pin and starts squeezing. Now that squeezing squeezes these epithelial cells and it will squeeze milk out of an epithelial cell into the duct. The duct will empty into each one of these little ductules, come down into the gland cistern and then eventually into the teat cistern. So without proper stimulation, whether by touching the udder or by stripping those teats, we're not going to get milk out of the udder. And these are things that farmers take into account when they bring a cow into the milking parlor, is the timing that has to go into all of this. Like we said, the mammary gland is a closed system. There's only one way in. Either or The only ways in are crossing the blood barrier, and that would be you know, components coming in for those epithelial cells to turn into milk or somatic cells entering. So somatic cells, those white blood cells, don't just exist in large amounts in the mammary gland. They come in response to some kind of trigger, whether that's bacteria or trauma. So think about it if you cut your finger, right? You have a normal circulating level of white blood cells in your body. But if you cut your finger, the circulating level of white blood cells is gonna be higher right by where that cut is to fight off an infection. Same thing in the mammary gland or we can enter through the teat end, and that's where pathogens would enter to potentially cause an infection. So like we said, mastitis, it's the inflammation of the mammary gland, and it's caused in response to bacteria, so something like Staphorus, a yeast, which we can see here in this picture, so you can see it budding, even algae can invade the udder, or some kind of trauma. Usually with mastitis, when we talk about a mastitis infection on a farm, we're talking about something caused by bacteria. So that's where most of our focus is gonna to be today. Mastitis is the most costly disease in the dairy industry worldwide, and it's cost somewhere from $300 to $450 per case. And that's for a couple of reasons. So we see decreases in production, so the animal physically produces less milk. Another one would be veterinary bills and treatments. So dairy farmers don't just willy-nilly prescribe antibiotics. They work with a veterinarian. They have treatments that they have been prescribed to try to combat things like mastitis. And in the worst case scenario, a cow might actually die from this disease. And it's fairly prevalent. We know that about 95% of US dairy herds had at least one case of mastitis each year. And probably 100% of US dairy herds have some kind of subclinical mastitis that they didn't see any physical changes with. And usually it can impact as much as 16% of each herd yearly. And this isn't that somebody's doing a bad job. This isn't something that the cow broke down. This is just because things happen. Humans get mastitis after when they're lactating. So do cows. So trying to control this environment, trying to prevent these issues from happening, is where a lot of our quality control comes into on a dairy farm. 
So what happens here is something in the protection line breaks down. So let's say that this teat sphincter didn't close as quickly as we would have liked after milking in an ideal scenario. So nothing else was wrong, the cows were completely clean, everything was perfect, but a bacteria happened to get in there. So these bacteria are gonna travel in through this teat sphincter and the teat cistern and then up and into the gland. And when they're in there, depending on the type of bacteria that we have, they can cause a lot of damage. So something like an E. coli, you can see right over here, um, is trying to evade an epithelial cell. E. coli tend to light up a cow's immune response fairly quickly. So cows will have a very swift response to something like an E. coli infection. Um, and we'd see a really large increase in somatic cell count. Why? Because there's an infection and they're responding to that infection. Something like Saph auris is a little bit sneakier. Uh, it has a lot of tricks up its sleeve. It can actually survive inside of something like a neutrophil, which is a type of white blood cell. Um, and they can actually wall themselves off in parts of the udder and wait for conditions to become more favorable. So we might not see as much of an immune response with something like that. But basically we'd have this bacteria come in here and we're being targeted by things like somatic cells, trying to destroy those bacteria and remove them from the udder to improve the immune to improve the health of that gland. So this is the body's natural response to something invading it, which isn't any different than me or use natural response to something invading our bodies. So somatic cells, white blood cells circulating in the mammary gland, they only increase in response to infection and they destroy invading bacteria ideally. So if it goes above 250,000 cells per milliliter for the entire quarter, or the entire udder, sorry, we're generally associating that with an infection if we're taking a cow sample. If we see higher somatic cell count and higher bacteria counts in the milk itself, we're generally associating that with a shorter shelf life when that product actually goes through pasteurization and goes to a store. And that's because with pasteurization, we'll talk more about this next week and I, I might just leave it for there, is we're still starting with a product that is poor quality if we have a higher somatic cell count and a higher bacteria count than something that doesn't. So starting with that higher level, we've got more changes to the overall uh, milk components. We've got more potential for bacteria to proliferate, which is why we focus so much on the cow side of milk quality. So we've got two main types of mastitis. We've got visual or clinical signs. And in the milk itself, we might see flakes or clots um, or changes in appearance in the udder. So we can see on this udder that this one, this particular quarter, looks fairly normal, it looks a lot smaller and it doesn't look kind of as hard as this one does. If we look at this quarter, we're seeing that it's swollen, it's red. If we touch it, it's probably hard and hot. Um, so those would be some visual signs that we would see that that cow probably has mastitis in this quarter. In subclinical, we, there are no visual signs. We see these beautiful udders that are rocking and rolling. You can see that nice sharp medium suspensory ligament right there holding it up to her body. But what we do see is an increased somatic cell count because she's having an immune response because there's an infection there. We've got two overall causes of mastitis. We'll, we'll pump through this pretty quickly so we can talk about controls. And there is contagious, which is spread from cow to cow, just like thinking about COVID-19 right now, right? It's not usually that contagious, but spread from animal to animal, the same way our contagious diseases are spread from person to person or environmental. And that's something that's gonna be endemic to the environment. And that's just bacteria that exists. We know a lot of bacteria just exists in the environment that we're exposed to every day. Um, in, the, in the cow's bedding, on the pasture, and the water, or other animals just have endemic environmental bacteria. So with contagious mastitis, we've got some main culprits um, that I, I won't read out for you, but they're spread through things like the milking machine inflations. So if we milk an infected cow and then use that same machine on another cow, we could potentially cause an infection. The hands of milking personnel, the back of your hands, the, the palm of your hand make really good places for bacteria to live for a short amount of time, which is why we say to wear gloves. Dirty udder towels used on multiple animals are a great way to spread contagious mastitis or even flies. So a fly lands on one udder, walks around, does its thing, lands on another one. That's a really good vector for spreading contagious mastitis, particularly something like Staph aureus. Again, just a long list of the contagious microorganisms responsible for mastitis. This is more for any of my farmers on the line who may have seen some of this stuff on any of their reports to try to think about how to fight it. The other one is environmental mastitis. And we said that was stuff that just existed in the environment. 
And one of the big ones for that are gram negative species. And a huge part of that are coliforms. So things like E. coli. E. coli causes mastitis. It's not always the E. coli that causes um, extreme responses in humans. It's not always E. heco 157. There are different types of E. coli, just like there's different strands of coronavirus. Um, but it does exist in the environment and causes quite a few mastitis infections. Klebsiella is another one. There's a whole laundry list of general gram negative species, but coliforms are the ones we think of usually. Another one is environmental streptococci. So things like Streptococcus hubris, Streptococcus dysgalactia, or even things like yeast molds and algae. And bacillus can also cause environmental mastitis. Again, a nice long laundry list of things that can cause issues. So with protecting milk quality, Farmers are aware of these risks to dairy cow health and consequently the milk supply. And from a business perspective and from a human perspective, it makes sense to protect our animals from these risks as much as we can. And that is a big part of a dairy farmer's job and daily routine is protecting these animals and protecting the milk supply. And we have layers of protection that farmers apply. The first one is managing the cow's environment. So if you've ever wondered why cows are in a barn instead of out on pasture, this is why we're trying to manage that cow's environment. We'll get into that a little bit later. Cleaning and disinfecting the udder is another layer of protection that we do every single time we milk a cow and cleaning and disinfecting the milking equipment that we do every single time we milk the herd. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'm sure y'all have definitely heard this before. And get your phones out, y'all. It is time for another quiz. I would like to know how many of you know what movie this is from. Spoiler alert, my husband did not know. <laughs> Fifty fifty split. Some people know it, some people don't. All right, I might have aged out this reference. Need to find something more current. <laughs> All right, whoever knew it, I'm going to need you to private message me so I can send you a prize for knowing <laughs> which movie this is from. So, this is from a movie called The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. And The Boy in the Plastic Bubble was immunocompromised and could not survive in the world. And unfortunately, this was based on a true story, but the uh, movie is a good way for us to think about the fact that we can't protect everything from the world. So we cannot put all of our cattle inside of a plastic bubble. So what do we do to try to protect them from all of these risk factors endemic to their environment? And the main way that we do that is through housing. And there's a couple different types of housing options that farmers use. We can use something like a free stall. So y'all can see from this picture that the animals are free to move around and lay where they would like. This is in particular is a sand free stall and it looks kind of dirty because it's in the process of being flushed with clean water to remove all of the stuff out of the alleyway to keep that alleyway cleaner. We've got fans, we've got open sidewalls. And what you can't see on this side is that there's a feed trough. So we're trying to meet all of those cows needs through this stall. And that stall defines the resting space for the cow. So she has her own little spot all to herself. A tie stall is similar to a free stall. In fact, the dimensions are almost identical, but in this one, she actually checks in to her own little area. And cows get so used to having their own spot that if they go out to pasture and they come back, they'll actually walk back into their own stall of their own volition and wait for their little thing to be attached. Um, the nice thing about something like a tie stall is that these animals have individual access to something like a water. I don't know if y'all can see that over here. I know this picture is kind of tiny, uh, but this is a water that two cows are sharing. And we can also see that they have individual access to their feed. So it allows that animal to have a lot more um, individualized care than something like a free stall would, because we know anything that happens in that spot is, a, is impacted directly to her. The next one that we're going to talk about, that that's where 7% of our U.S. herd is, sorry, free stalls are 40% of the dairies in the U.S., tie stalls are 39% of the dairies in the U.S., dry lots are 7% of the dairies in the U.S. And for us here in Tennessee, this looks really weird, but we have a lot of rain and we have really high humidity. And that's not necessarily true out in 
far western Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. They're a very different climate. So doing this dry lot setting where they have access to shade but are on a big dry lot, that's not that odd there. And it's not necessarily, it's not a bad way to care for animals. It just doesn't work as well in Tennessee because our climate's different. The next one that we're going to talk about is pasture, which is where a lot of us think we would want to see cows is out on pasture. Um, but we don't always think about the things that could be impacting a cow out on pasture, particularly in Tennessee. We already talked about the heat and the humidity. That impacts cows quite a bit, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But it, all of these ways are excellent ways to care for cows as long as you do it right. The last one that we're going to talk about is an open barn. And this particular open barn is a compost barn. So it's similar to a free stall, similar to a tie stall, except it's completely open on the inside. And all of these cows get to lay wherever they want. Um, and they're normally on some kind of bed. The bed can be made out of sand, it can be made out of shavings, it can be made out of straw. This particular one is made out of compost and it actively composts underneath the animal. And you might say, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible, but I want you to look at this cow right here. And I guess kind of all the white cows. So look at most of these white cows you can see that they are laying on this bedding, but they're pretty clean. That's pretty clean for a dairy cow. We're not seeing a whole lot of dirt stuck to them. We're not seeing a whole lot of issues that way. So again, these systems can work really well as long as you manage them correctly. Housing can influence health, hygiene, production, consequently through somatic cell count and mastitis incidence of pathogens, not just production amount, reproduction, well-being, and farm profitability. So because of that, we focus on the housing side quite a lot. And the keys to environmental mastitis and the keys to housing are the CDCs. And no, that's not the Center for Disease Control. That is clean, dry, and comfortable. So we've got a bunch of different systems here. We've got sand bedding, where this cow is clean, dry, and comfortable. And we have a compost bedded pack barn, where this girl is zonked out sleeping and this girl is relaxing. So as long as it's clean, dry, and comfortable, it doesn't matter which system you're using. What we want is a clean and dry area. And the reason we're focused on this so much is because it reduces bacteria loads at the T end. We already talked about there's only one way in and there's only one way out, and that's through the T end. So if we reduce bacteria load at the T end, we've reduced the chance that that cow is going to have an infection because we've reduced the total amount of bacteria that can try to invade the udder. It also reduces material attaching to the teat end. So if we, if we have wet bedding that kind of sticks to that teat end or sticks anywhere on the cow, we've dramatically increased the chance that that cow is going to get an infection because we've made it easier for that bacteria on the teat end in particular to get into the udder because it has constant exposure. It's just kind of chilling there waiting for its opportunity. It also reduces additional stress on a cow. Um, I should have made a poll for this, but I didn't. Um, there might be a way to do a show of hands who likes sleeping on a wet bed? I don't know if there's a way to do, I think there's a way to do show of hands. There might not be. I'm just going to assume that none of you enjoy sleeping on a wet bed, because I know I certainly don't. <laughs> yes, you figured out how to raise your hands. Perfect. I definitely don't like sleeping on a wet bed. Um, neither does a cow. Who, nobody wants to sleep on a bed that's the wrong size for them either, or sleep on a bed that's too hard or too soft. We all have these things that we try to tailor ourselves towards. And while we can't ask the cow directly, which type of bed do you prefer, we can make sure that we meet those things that we know are going to reduce stress on the cow. It also reduces disease likelihood in cows and in calves, because in a clean, dry area, we're talking about all areas on the farm. We're talking about the resting area. We're talking about the calving area. We're talking about the alleyways as much as possible and as much as is reasonable. We're talking about the pasture. We don't want the pasture to be muddy and nasty and full of holes and places for flies to hide. So if we're on a pasture, perfect segue there, me, good job. We want to avoid wet and muddy areas. And that might mean rotating to a different pasture. It might mean moving the animals to a different section or even going through and adding drainage if you can, or laying gravel pathways so that when cows walk back to resources like to food or to water, they're not creating a track to get that would get it muddy and increase any material that might stick to the cow. This is one that I think we're going to fight with until the day all of us are no longer here, but absolutely no pond access. Remember I said how algae can cause mastitis? 
yeah, any kind of antibiotic we want to prescribe to that animal doesn't really touch that. Algae is not a bacteria, so it doesn't really respond to antibiotics. If cows get in ponds, we have exposure for things like Pseudomonas, Proteus, yeast, mold, Prototheca, and Bacillus. There's lots of nasty, nasty things that cattle can get into their udders from the water. And I missed this photo opportunity, and I really wish I hadn't. I was driving down the road in Tennessee one day, and I looked out my window, and it was a beef farm. It wasn't a dairy farm. But one of the cows was defecating, one of the cows was urinating, and one of the cows was drinking the water all within the same pond. So this is another excellent reason to not allow pond access. And we talked about heat stress and needing cooling strategies, but there are, way to cool, there are ways to cool cows without potentially exposing them to additional stressors and additional pathogens by allowing them to get into a pond. In the barn, we want lots and lots of clean bedding like we already talked about, and routine bedding maintenance is key. Um, in the dairy industry, sand bedding is king, and that's because it is inorganic and not certified USDA on organic, but it doesn't have carbon in it. So it doesn't grow bacteria as well as something like straw or something like shavings. So it keeps cows cleaner and reduces that whole environmental bacteria load much more effectively. Um, all of these can work really well. It's just the amount of maintenance that's gonna go into it. In the barn, barn walkways and resting areas are routinely cleaned, and that's at least once a day to provide a CDC area. Remember, that's clean, dry, and comfortable. New bedding is added to ensure resting areas are comfortable, so either that's filling in more sand if cows have kicked it out, or if we're on something like a mattress or a gel mat, adding more shavings to make sure those cows are comfortable. And we want to make sure our water troughs and eating areas are cleaned as needed to remove things like algae growth, dirt, things like that. On the farm, we want to make sure we provide a non-stressful environment. And one of the main things we have to do in Tennessee and the Southeast in general is pay attention to seasonal stressors. And our main one is heat stress. So I was down in Louisiana with my parents last week. Uh, they had some hurricane damage and it was record breaking highs of 104 degrees. Now I was not happy. I was heat stressed, but cows like temperatures much cooler than us. Most of these animals historically come from places like France or the British Isles. They don't come from Tennessee. So they like temperatures that are closer to the 60 degree range and start getting stressed at temperatures and humidity indexes. So when we have temperature plus humidity, which we do here in Tennessee, most of the year our cows are experiencing some kind of heat stress. At least one day every month of the year in Tennessee, cows experience heat stress. So that's another reason that we want to employ things like shade or bring cows into a barn because we want to reduce that external stress on these animals. And we'll use things like fans and sprinklers to cool cows down. So kind of like you would if you were going to Dollywood and you walked under the mister. You get a little bit cooler from walking through that area where you've done evaporative cooling with air movement. That's what we do for our cows as well. We also provide freedom from thirst and hunger, freedom from pain, and freedom from stress and fear. The parlor is one of our main control points for mastitis. So we talked about the environment and trying to just limit bacteria exposure overall and make sure that those animals were as healthy and as happy as they could be. In the parlors where we protect the udder itself. And again, there's different types of parlors, but all of them can work well. This particular parlor is a herringbone parlor. And we have some suggested guidelines that we encourage farmers to use and that most farmers use. The number one is always wear gloves during milking because like we talked about earlier, Mastitis, can survive, mastitis pathogens can survive on your hands. So if I go in and I do all of the steps to make sure that one udder is as clean as it can possibly be, as soon as I'm done with that cow and I go touch the next one, guess what? If I don't have gloves on, I've just contaminated that next cow. So that's why you always wanna wear gloves during milk. We wanna limit water usage. Bacteria use water like a super highway and water tends to go to the lowest point on an animal. And one of the lowest points on an animal for water to drip off of is the udder and the teat end. Remembering that the teat end is the pathway into the quarter. So if we're using a lot of water and we have it pooling on that teat end, we're gonna have, we could potentially have some issues with mastitis. We also wanna keep a routine. We talked about needing to signal that pathway to make sure that milk was actually released from the entire udder and not just the teat cistern and the gland cistern. A routine is a big part of that. We also use something called pre and post dips. And think about this as our way of washing the cow's teats. So it is a dip. 
that's either iodine based or chlorhexidine based that's usually the same thing that your vet will use to disinfect um, their countertops in between animals or something that's hydrogen peroxide based there's other bases out there but these are the main ones that we we tend to see and what we do is we have a cup and we have this stuff in it and we literally dip each one of those teats let it sit for about 30 seconds so the same amount of time you want to wash your hands and then we wipe it off we want to wipe it off with a clean towel one clean towel for every single animal because if we don't we've gone through all of this work we could potentially just transfer it on to somebody else we also want to limit over milking um, I, with over milking we can get things like teat and damage so actually chap those teat ends if those teat ends become chapped they get a little bit um, calloused and it gives the bacteria a better place to hide and it also keeps it from closing as effectively so we can actually increase our risk of mastitis so these are things that farmers do every single time cows come into the parlor to be milked we're thinking about the pathway of milk so step one cow enters parlor <laughs> step two the milking unit is attached after using a pre-dip so the cow comes in we're going to strip the teat out so pull some streams of milk out of each teat we're going to dip it wipe it off and then attach the milking unit. Milk is gonna travel through those lines, so through the unit itself, into stainless steel collection lines to a collection area or a bulk tank. And that looks something like this. And again, there's different types, different sizes, but they all serve the same general purpose. The bulk tank is cooled to less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit as quickly as possible to make sure that bacteria can't grow under that refrigeration temperature. So if we leave milk out at room temperature, something like E. coli is gonna double every 30 minutes. But we don't want that to happen. So we cool it as quickly as possible to keep bacteria from growing. Remembering that anything that's already in there is going to be in there, which is why we try to control the environment as much as possible. So I have a short video for y'all that I'm going to play and feel free to make fun of my voice. This was intended for children. So <laughs> feel free to make fun of me later. This is a robot milking a cow. Crazy, right? It's amazing. It is connected to her udder. Don't worry, she didn't mind. And this is the path of milk. Cow, line, milk. Cow, line, milk. Now, the reason I show you this ridiculous clip of me being, well, ridiculous, because I want you to see that this is what milk is. Once it comes from the cow, it looks fairly similar to what you're going to get at the store. And we'll get into the processing side more in a month, but I wanted you to have that visual of this is all that's involved. We have a lot of structure before a cow ever gets to the parlor. We have a lot of control once the cow gets to the parlor and a milking robot does the same thing. It stimulates those teats, it disinfects those teats, it dries those teats, and then it collects, connects a robotic arm where the milking unit is. But even here, we see that it travels a very short distance into a collection vessel. And after it comes out, you can see the stainless steel piping here. It's going to get piped to a bulk tank, just like any other parlor would be. But this is, that is it. That is milk coming out of a cow. This Oop. is a great stop. Go down. All right. So in the parlor, and this is more in the, this is partly the parlor and partly the bulk tank. So all of that equipment that we use to milk a cow, every single time it's used, after we're done milking the herd, we thoroughly clean and sanitize all the equipment. So all of those units that connect to a cow, all of those stainless steel lines, and then the bulk tank after it's been emptied, we do this as well. And we start with something like a warm water rinse to remove anything that's just loose in the system. Then we'll do a detergent wash, and then we'll do a disinfectant cycle. So think of this as our industrial way of washing our dishes. We're gonna do a warm water rinse to get the stuff off. We're gonna do a detergent wash to clean it and then a disinfectant cycle to make sure that it is clean and ready for the next run through. And we test to make sure that we're cleaning effectively. Like I said, it's one of the most highly regulated industries in the United States. Now, one of the first ones that we look at is SPC, which is a standard plate count. And this is the total bacteria present in raw milk because all milk is raw when it comes out of the cow. It's all raw until it's pasteurized. And that total bacteria count lets us know where we might have some quality control breakdowns. So if it's too high, we start looking at things in the environment, being like, okay, why is my standard plate count high? Has it been a little bit dirtier? Have I had a lot of rain? Um, is there something that went wrong in my housing environment? And these are things that we look at anytime milk is picked up. Coliform count is another big one, and that's an indicator of cow and milk hy milking hygiene. So was the cow clean when she came into the parlor? And did I do a good job with my prep to make sure I removed anything that may have been on that udder? Our LPC is a little bit different. That's our laboratory pasteurization count. And that's an indicator of pasteurization resistant bacteria. 
and usually this is caused by poor equipment cleaning. So something went wrong in either that warm water rinse, that wash cycle, or that detergent cycle. So something is growing in those lines. And these are all things that farmers pay a lot of attention to and try to make sure that none of these things go out of whack. Okay, I've got another poll for y'all. So my question for you is, if your animal gets sick, and it can be your cow, your cat, your dog, your parakeet, I don't care, what do you do when that animal gets sick? Again, think about a one word response. We're gonna populate another word cloud here. Vet, call a doctor, I like it. Medicine, what else we got? Separate from the rest of the herd, absolutely. I guess these days we would call it quarantining, wouldn't we? So pretty consistent responses. We're gonna reach out to a vet. We're gonna reach out to a professional to take care of that animal because we don't want to leave that animal just being sick. That's not our plan. That's not what we're going to do. So a farmer is going to do the exact same thing. If things go wrong, because sometimes prevention doesn't work, contagious or environmental bacteria can invade the udder. And we'll work with a veterinarian to make sure that we can try to get that cow healthy again, because no one wants to just have a sick animal on their property. Um, it's not good for our hearts. It's not good for our product. It's just, it's not ideal. So it does happen, but it's never what we're striving for. And if a cow gets mastitis, we're gonna try to use antibiotics to help fight off that infection, just the same way you would if it was your cat or your dog or your parakeet or your kid. We're going to try to make sure we can get that animal as healthy as quickly as possible. So with antibiotic use, farmers have something called a VCPR which is a veterinary client patient relationship. Now, as part of this veterinary client patient relationship, they will work with dairy farmers to prudently use antibiotics when prevention doesn't work. And this isn't necessarily just going to be for mastitis, but from a milk quality control standpoint, that's what we're gonna focus on. And there's some keys that I want y'all to be really aware of before we're done today. Antibiotics are not allowed in milk sold for human consumption. I'm gonna repeat that. Antibiotics are not allowed in milk sold for human consumption. So the milk, the cheese, the yogurt, the sour cream, the whatever dairy, the butter, whatever product you buy at the store, antibiotics cannot enter that food supply. And to prevent that, there is testing at the farm and the processor level. Um, there's actually snap tests that are sold. So kind of what you would see in a heartworm test for your dogs at the vet's office that people can use cow side to make sure that the antibiotics are no longer in their animal. So we'll actually keep that milk out of the tank. Um, it normally gets dumped down the drain because there's nothing else we can do with it. But if something goes wrong and communication breaks down somewhere and milk from a treated cow is accidentally added to the milk tank, what happens? Like I said, it is not legal to sell that milk. So that milk doesn't get sold, but the farmer might not know. It might have been an oversight or somebody else, some, an employee may have done it or things got switched up, leg bands came off so we weren't sure which cow was treated. But there is a milk sample taken from every bulk tank before milk is loaded onto the collection truck. That bulk tank sample is tested for antibiotics and milk quality markers when we get to the processing side. So if that sample tests positive for antibiotics, the entire tanker is dumped down the drain. It does not get repurposed. It does not pass go. It does not collect $200. Yes, I played Monopoly last night. And the sample for that farm that introduced antibiotics is identified. That farmer is then responsible for reimbursing any other dairies whose milk was on that tanker. And obviously they're not getting paid for their lost milk. So number one, farmers have no desire to unnecessarily treat cows. And number two, they also have no desire to pay for a load of dumped milk. This is not up on anybody's idea of what they're gonna consider a fun day. So antibiotic use is very strictly monitored and dairy farmers are very judicious with their antibiotic use. So I'm gonna leave a, a few minutes for questions here. I know we've only got about seven minutes left and I haven't seen a whole lot of activity in the Q&A, but I'm hoping that this answered that question in the beginning about why the cow side of milk quality is important.
important. And it's because the environment plays a huge role in cattle health and milk quality. And without controlling that environment, and without trying to make sure that that animal is as close to a plastic bubble as we can get, there's a whole lot more risks. And farmers try to limit these risk factors present in the environment and from other cattle, whether it's protecting against contagious mastitis or environmental bacteria. Hygiene, cleaning, and sanitation are present at multiple stages, providing layers of protection. So hopefully if something breaks down someplace else, we can catch it. The parlor protocols are specifically set up to protect against contagious and environmental pathogens. So that's why we have two different steps. We have a pre-dip to get rid of anything that's there. We have gloves to make sure we don't transfer things from one animal to another. And we didn't really talk about it as much, but we can separate animals that we think might have something that could be contagious and keep them to the very last. And that milk probably won't go into the milk supply, um, but we know that way that it doesn't infect any other animals. The post-dip, so we'll do that same thing again at the end of milking, to protect against any environmental things that may invade that udder when that teat sphincter isn't completely closed. And then again, we're checking to see what happens at the bulk tank level, we're checking to see what happens at the farm level, and if anything goes wrong, there are structures in place to make sure that that's taken care of. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you for working on my little experiment with me, which was the poll everywhere option. Um, and hopefully y'all enjoyed that. Um, if you're interested in master dairy credit, please complete our exit survey. If you liked this, if you hated it, if you want to know more, please complete our exit survey. And you're going to get to that. I'm going to type it in the chat right now. You're going to go to tiny.udk.edu slash C2C, so cow two cup underscore and survey. So yes, there is an underscore there. So if you copy that into um, any of your browsers, that should take you straight to the survey and just lets us collect some stuff from y'all today. So are there, are there any questions about anything? Um, anything that was unclear you'd like to know more about? Yes, excellent point. Milk treated or infected cows last, and that can definitely help to reduce any exposure to the rest of the herd or anything from going into the tank because then you're just dumping everything at the end. Thank you, that's an excellent point. No. Apparently the survey link is not copying. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm not sure what else to do with that survey link. Um, I'll, I'm going to send out um, a recording of this after the meeting, and I'll include the survey link there as well. So if you just want to click it from your email, that is fine too. Any thoughts on the poll everywhere where y'all are still on here with me? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Yes, I know I said it's funny. Don't laugh at me, Caitlin. <laughs> My moderator's laughing at me. <laughs> we like the polling, perfect. Thanks everyone. I hope this information was helpful. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides, please reach out to me and I will send them to you. And on that note, we've only got three minutes left, so I will not keep you from lunch any longer. Thank you for joining us today and I hope to see you next month for part two on the processing side.